The Unshackled Waves, episode 199. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company for another international affairs themed show. In the United States last week, mail bombs were sent to prominent Democrats, George Soros and to CNN, all which did not go off. Of course, President Trump's rhetoric was blamed for inspiring this attempted attack. Then on Saturday, 11 Jews were shot dead at a synagogue by a man holding anti-Semitic views. Again, Trump was blamed for this by pandering to the alt-right in his campaign. Brazil held its runoff presidential election with nationalist strongman Jair Bolsonaro winning on a traditionalist and anti-socialist platform. And Angela Merkel in Germany, meanwhile, fell on her political sword, announcing she would be stepping down as Chancellor in 2021 after disastrous results for her party in recent state elections. To discuss all this, I am joined again by the Unshackled's editor-at-large, Steel Archer. Steel, welcome back to the show. Hi, Tim. Thanks for having me back on TU Waves. It's fantastic to be back. Oh, the reason I've got you back on is because immediately after we'd finished recording last week's show, there was another major international development, and that was the pipe bombs mailed to prominent uh, Democrats in the, the United States. It was sent to Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and then uh, businessman George Soros, and there was uh, two sent to, to CNN directed at uh, some of their national security uh, advisors. Now, when, when this happened, it, it seemed all too strange that they were uh, mailed to all Democrats. There was even one mailed to uh, Robert De Niro. And of course, uh, a lot of people on the right uh, said, oh, this is probably a false flag because it's the middle of the, the midterm uh, elections. And this was what's termed an October surprise, which is, uh, that, that's a term used to describe so something unexpected that happens in October that benefits one particular candidate over another. But turns out it, it wasn't uh, a false flag, as many people uh, thought or perhaps were, were hoping, but it was a, a Trump supporter, 56-year-old Caesar uh, Syok. Yeah, so this is a very interesting development. Um, we're coming up to the midterms. This is probably one of the most important midterm elections of the United States history, of US history. So everything that's building up is building up in a fundamental way. And we've had the migrant caravan, uh, which you and I went through in, in great detail last time on the show. And now we have this pipe bomb, uh, which conveniently gets mailed out to all democratic uh you know, figures and, and, and political figures. Yeah, um, I've got really the list in front of me now. So there's, yeah, Eric Holder, Maxine Waters, John Brennan was the one that went to, to C CNN, former CIA director, Joe Biden, former vice president, uh, James Clapper, who's a former national intelligence director, also vice CNN, Cory Booker, Camilla Harris, both Democrat senators, and then there was also another bill, uh, billionaire, uh, Tom uh, Steyer. So pretty, pretty much got all the all the major people. Yeah, yes, Tim, uh, that's true. There was a whole list of Democratic uh, senators and and former vice presidents and and security operatives and everything, and uh, it's all it's all it's all very conveniently classed and couched right before the midterms. And, and something I want you and your audience to take away, Tim, is that Alex Jones, before he went off air, before before he got banned off uh, Facebook and Twitter and these giant social media platforms, he was actually he actually sort of coined and was talking about this notion of uh, the season of false flags. He said we're entering the season of false false flags, like it's some sort of football game or like it's some sort of game or something. Uh, and then he said that it would be thrown to help the Democratic Party to, to drum up support for the Democratic Party. Now, that's a very interesting notion because he said that and then he's gone now and he and he's obviously over there on InfoWars um, saying these things, but his voice has disappeared from the internet. And so the only way we can engage with this 
this pipe bomb, uh, ex you know, explosion of, of falsehood is 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 that is through the mainstream media is through the mainstream media. So it's it's very interesting and it seems very suspicious to me that that um, that that it's all Democrats and that we ha it's all before the midterm and it's all very complex and confusing. It's it, it doesn't it's it smells very suspicious. Well, Ben Shapiro was, he's one of the prominent uh, US conservative uh, commentators who, who he dismissed all these uh, false flag uh, theories uh, straight up and said uh, it's most likely to be a crazy person. And he went through uh, SIAC's uh, history. He's got a long criminal history. Uh, he's got two failed uh, businesses. He has a history of uh, steroid abuse. And so said, you know, these are the people that send pipe bombs to, to politicians, uh, crazy people. And uh, Trump shouldn't be blamed for the actions of a, a deranged individual. But we're, we're living in the era of hyper partisan politics and of course Trump's uh, rhetoric is uh, blamed for inspiring Psyox uh, uh, well, he says, uh, Syak, that he, he didn't mean any harm. He just, for some reason, wanted to, to mail these and, and mess with these uh, people. And yeah, a lot, uh, there's a lot of mainstream media has you know, uh, brought, uh, dug up uh, Trump saying that oh, he wanted to, to punch protesters in the face. He'd pay for the legal bills of uh, his supporters who beat up uh, protesters and he also endorsed uh, congressman uh, greg uh, guyfort's uh, attack on a, a reporter uh, a, a few a few months ago so of course they're saying that that trump's divisive rhetoric has uh, created this heightened uh, political scene and uh, therefore it's trump's fault that that is uh, spurious i mean it, when when the economy suffers crime goes up okay and trump is trying to resurrect the economy and therefore crime goes down barack obama presided over the economy that built these crazies uh the period of time that we're talking about with, with let's say sizak what ben, what ben shapiro is saying uh this man has a check in pass well his check had passed was done by presidents before, uh, whether that be Barack Obama or George Bush or Bill Clinton. So you can't just turn around and say within the last few months that this man has done all of this stuff and that Trump is fully to blame because because Trump said some mean words. Uh, this this doesn't this doesn't make any sense. Uh, what what uh, what would make sense though? Is that the people are waking up to to the the regime? I mean, to the to the tyranny that that's 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 being cast over the land like a black shadow uh, called the Democratic Party. Um, whether or not whether or not it's it's real or not, I mean, I mean, we we like you can look up Barack Obama's real estate address. I know that, but. Why, why would Barack Obama be checking his own mail anyway? I mean, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't really make much sense. These guys are the most protected people in the world. They have the most uh, secure uh, you know, locations uh, and, and security that checks everything. They have food tasters and they have all sorts of things. Why, why would all of these people, you know, check their mail and get impacted by these i mean it, it doesn't is it there's a haze there there's a haze there and it, it could be a democratic conspiracy i'm not saying for certain that it is but it's there's a haze there and 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 this man's checkered pass has been done in presidents before it's not trump's trump's some something that trump has done um when he said mean words or his intact elizabeth warren or something that you know inspires people to, to uh, push pipe bombs on political opponents. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense in a rational, uh, in a rational world. And of course, uh, everyone seems to have forgotten that there was a, a Bernie Sanders supporter who uh, shot a whole uh, bunch of uh, Republicans uh, playing playing baseball and. Uh, uh, 
injured uh, congressman uh, Steve Scalise, who's in uh, recovery. And of course, Maxine Waters said you've got to uh, confront uh, Trump officials, uh, where uh, uh, Trump uh, affiliated people, wherever they are. Of course, uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the, the White House press secretary, she was chased out of a, a restaurant. So uh, it's not like uh, the, the left can say, oh, we've just been, you know, rainbows and uh, uh, sweet cakes. I mean, they're, they're they're the ones who've initiated this this period of heightened rhetoric. I mean, the reason that Trump rose uh, so uh, rose to the top of the Republican field because people are seeing the the left uh, out of control at the university campuses and out on the streets with with Black Lives Matter, and Trump was a reaction to that. Trump's reacting to the aggression of of the left, and that's why he's talking in this heightened state of rhetoric. He's just responding. The left, the left has always been the violent ones. That's that's the whole point. Because if you look at if you look at like you mentioned, Black Lives Matter or Antifa or, or whatever, they're just copying their global masters. You know, Barack Obama, who's funding Hezbollah, or you know, he's giving he's giving money to Iran or you know to to the Saudis or something. You know, so so they look up to their leaders, and their leaders are engaged in, uh, you know, what what did what did Trump say? He's the founder of ISIS, right? So, so Barack Obama's out there founding ISIS, and yet, you know, Antifa is just copying on a miniature scale, on a micro scale, uh, what Barack Obama's doing. And, uh, and if you look at the uniform of ISIS and Antifa, they look exactly the same. <laughs> um, so you can see that the left, the left is extremely violent. You can't, you can't walk down the street as a Trump supporter in a Trump hat without having your head blown off by a shotgun. It's, it's absolutely crazy so the left is the violent ones the left are out there you know they uh, attack and abuse uh and and yell down and shout down and and, and act ultra violent uh, and then uh, turn around and say oh uh you know th there's there's a, a trump supporter with a with a hat on that's violence or your speech is violence or or whatever. So you can see that the, 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 these, these, this, this man with his pipe bombs, I mean, it's just part of an ongoing cycle of, of chaos. And I mean, I mean, you talked about Scalise, right? I, I, I mean, who, who remembers Rand Paul? He got attacked by his neighbor. Yeah, uh, yeah. His law. There's heaps of incidents. Uh, oh yeah, so it's it's funneling right right up. I mean, this is this is happening on uh, you know conservative side and, and the democratic side. But that you know the Scalise was a well, it, well, he was a he was a Bernie supporter. So there was the migrant caravan that we discussed last week, and then of course the the next day was when the the mail bombs uh, were were discovered, and then on the weekend there was a a mass shooting at a synagogue in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Robert Bowers, uh, age forty six, he killed uh, eleven Jews at the at the Tree of Life uh, synagogue. Now he said that he did this because he wanted all Jews to to die. Uh, blamed them for. Uh, open borders and the spread of globalism, and he hated Trump. It should be noted because he called him a a, a globalist, a, a kike uh, lover. But uh, nonetheless, uh, Trump was was blamed for it due to his uh, uh, apparent alt right support. I, I don't understand this whole notion that Donald Trump is anti Semitic. You know, he he his his family. Is deeply ingrained with Jews. His whole cabinet is Goldman Sachs. Uh, <laughs> you know, he, he, he loves Israel to the hilt. Which actually, if you know anything about the alt right, or if you know anything about, uh, um, you know, the anti-Semitic crowd who are on the so-called right of politics, um, they hate Donald Trump. There's no Donald Trump support there because of Trump's Jewish connections and his. And, and he moved so there. He he started this uh, or the discussion we're having in Australia at the moment of moving the the Israeli uh, uh, the embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Trump uh, he moved the the U.S. embassy uh, there. It had been a, a policy of presidents past him, but never implemented. Trump was the first one to to do it. His daughter. Ivanka, along with um, her husband, Jared Kushner, who is uh, Jewish, they opened the, the new embassy uh, in, Jer in Jerusalem.
Yeah, so so Trump is Trump is a very pro Jew, uh, pro pro Israel, you know, sort of leader, and this this idea that he is somehow an anti-Semitic, you know, anti-Israel, anti-U.S. Israel alliance sort of thing is is laughable to to say the least. Um, so. You know, so this man is clearly is clearly uh, this, this man who did the shooting is clearly uh, an anti-Trump guy, and I have to write a retraction actually because I I, I in my initial research because I did the, the article so quickly uh, I, I found that he was a pro. Trump guy, but I found out recently that that's fake news, and they'll have to go and retract that and write a new article and say, "Well, actually, hang on, this guy actually really didn't like Donald Trump. He he called him a globalist." Um, and, and it's funny because Trump himself called Steve uh, Mnuchin or, or or the former economic advisor, whoever it was, uh, a globalist, um, or Gary Cohen or someone. So um, you know, so so. <sighs> There's this idea that that this guy is a pro-Trump guy. It's fake news. I have to do a retraction on it myself. But he did kill eleven. He did kill eleven Jews at this Tree of Life synagogue. And um, although a tra although a tragedy, you know, the the whole he he did it with an AR-15, um, which again we're coming up to midterms. One of the big topics in the United States is gun control and they're specifically talking about AR-15s. The, the left, the far left in the United States has been anti-Israel and you know, pro-Palestinian for, for a long, 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 long time. And the very far left of that anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian spectrum, uh, you know, is the same is the same ones that are anti-gun, which fits in with this profile. Uh, the same ones that, that you know, uh, the, the, these, these fit in with this profile. Is it, so, it's a far left conspiracy um, to try and knock Trump out and to do this. I've heard some, uh, you know, some screeching on the internet that maybe this is MK Ultra. Um, you know, the, the Democrats or or, or or the CIA, or, you know, pro democratic elements within the CIA or FBI have, uh, you know, committed MK Ultra and and done this, you know, to swing swing the election. But it's all looking very suspicious. We just talked about the pipe bombs. Now we're talking about a Jewish conspiracy, you know, where, where they're attacking Jews and, and that's something they think that they can hit Trump hard on. Well, the, the reason why they uh, say that this is Trump's fault is because they, they, they say that he dog whistles to the alt-right. Remember in the, uh, uh, the presidential campaign, uh, David Duke, uh, former uh, Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, endorsed him and then uh, Trump uh, didn't disavow David Duke right away. And then there was the, the, the Charlottesville uh, protest, which um, one uh, white nationalist killed one of the the Antifa uh, pro uh, protesters, and and Trump said he condemned the uh, the violence on many sides, and then they went and interviewed Richard Spencer, one of the alt right leaders, saying that uh, I interpret uh, Trump's uh, remarks there as uh, still being supportive of us, and we still uh, support him. And of course, the you, you talk about the the, the left uh they're they anti anti zionist pro palestinian but uh there a lot of the De uh, a lot of Jew american jews they they vote democrat uh, there's a lot of democratic politicians who are jewish and uh, let's not forget that the most pr prominent uh, jewish organization in the united states is the anti-defamation league which is a left-wing uh, jewish advo advocacy group so uh, it's 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 not all like people think that uh, uh, in the conventional thing that the the left is anti-israel the right is is pro uh israel but it's it's not as as straightforward as that yeah that there's these there's these left and right divides there's these there's these splinter groups of conservatives and neo-nazis and and white white supremacists and pro-white groups and there, there's a lot there's a lot of there's a lot of uh d diversity in the in in the whole but I, I would have to say that that this man, I mean, he said something like, "All Jews must die." Um, you know, screw your optics. I'm going in. I I I feel like 
that sort of rhetoric, screw your optics, I mean, whose optics? Is he, is he talking about the alt-right? Because if he's talking about the alt-right, I don't, I don't know if that, it, does, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it, it fits the profile, but it fits the profile too perfectly for the Democrats. I mean, someone who was truly trying to work for the alt-right or for a nationalist cause would not have used an AR-15 because they know how politically damaging that is to their own cause. So why would, why, would, why would you use that type of weapon if it wasn't some sort of conspiracy? That, that is, the, the fact that he actually used that weapon is a huge blight on, on his whole narrative. I mean, it, I'm not sure. Yeah, let's also remember it's not just Trump that's been blamed as a as a consequence, and uh, like the other incidents designed, uh, it's an October surprise to uh, be used against Trump in the the midterms. But uh, we've seen that uh, if even if you're you know alt light and uh, to, uh, talking about the the problems with uh, globalism uh, global elites that's interpreted as anti-semitic now we uh, i saw john safran on abc's the drum monday night saying that our oh, people who talk about uh, globalists are so what they really mean is the the jews uh, control uh, everything and we've also seen uh, gab uh, dot ai uh, which is a free speech Twitter alternative because uh, Robert Bowers, uh, he uh, posted some of his anti-Semitic material on uh, Gab. They've been uh, deplatformed. Their hosting uh, has been uh, revoked and uh, PayPal and Stripe are no longer processing uh, payments. Their, 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 their website is now completely shut down. It just uh, reads uh, a statement saying, we'll be back and we don't apologize for... Uh, defending the the value uh, of of free speech, so yeah, it has even even for moderate right wing people, as I mentioned, alt alt light. I mean, they uh, Alex Jones, who he's a civic nationalist. I mean, and that, uh, he's been deplatformed from everywhere. I mean, anyone who's not basically a mainstream neoconservative is now going to be uh, targeted as uh, dog whistling to these extremists. Well, that that's exactly right, Tim. And one of the one of the main points is that they've been pushing back on free speech for a long time, and how they how they do it is they edge it in. And, and that's what, you know, people, prominent figures like Nigel Farage, even Milo Yiannopoulos in his day, uh, you know, uh, Gavin McGuinness or, or, uh, or others have been pushing back against this notion of political correctness because it's a creep mentality. It's a creep mentality. Firstly, every, everything and everyone is racist when they do anything that people don't like. If you, if you wake up in the morning, you're a racist. If you, if you mind your own business and get on a bus or if you drive a car you're a racist you know every everything is racist eating certain types of food or whatever milk or whatever everything is racist everything is sexist or something like that they push back on free speech but now you the, the goalpost has moved because the word racist has become almost saturated and meaningless so now they're pushing as you said john safran is pushing the boundaries and the 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 bastion um that that is anti-semitism that is you know globalism if you attribute globalism with anti-semitism or whatever um because of some of the power of of the, these jewish lobbies and some of these jewish corporate interests and, and others uh which you know by any any uh, analytical measurable standard is is quite influential and, and powerful um you know they the the these labels become uh, dangerous to institutions to corporations to individuals um and, and, and sometimes countries uh, such you know so um you know so people have to uh you know watch out and and, and be careful um because these labels once they're attributed um they they jeopardize you know whole whole lives whole industries corporate agendas or whatever um this guy who did this shooting um he, you know, if he's a far left extremist or a far right extremist or whatever end of the political spectrum you you want uh he he sees this anti-semitism whatever he sees in it he, whatever he sees that it accomplishes 
uh, as his way to push back against what he sees as evil forces. And I mean, Donald Trump, um, he went to the funerals. The, the, government, did, the governor didn't show um, that the, 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 there was mass protest, you know, just because he's the orange man, just because he's Donald Trump, you know, they didn't really care. They're just using these funerals as a, as a political tool or as a weapon to attack Donald Trump every, every, every chance they can get. Um, but who is to blame for the rise of anti-Semitism in, in the first place? And it, I think you will find it's the pro-Palestinian, uh, you know, far left, uh, usually democratic, democratic class of, of, of people, uh, especially because the Republican Party is so well known uh, for being a bastion of, of Israel uh, Americana, you know, this Jewish American, uh, you know, Christian Jew alliance. Um, so I, I think this man is uh, probably mentally disturbed, but he, 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 he's obviously seen something and whatever he's seen is 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 very interesting and it's not it's it's the the media is again screwing screwing the narrative changing the narrative manipulating the narrative to make it look like somehow trump is an anti-semite which again it's just not true it's just not true um the dog whistling it, it's it's a political play it's it's a it's just a minor it's just a minor domestic issue it's nothing Brazil had their second round of their presidential election with nationalist uh, populist candidate Jair Bolsonaro uh, winning. 55% uh, of the vote against the Workers' Party candidate Fernando Haddad. Uh, Bolsonaro, he had uh, won the, the first round with 47% of the vote, so he nearly won on the, the, the first vote. Now, he'd been called the, the Trump of, of Latin America. He'd actually, though he'd actually been in, in politics for uh, 30 years, he was a well-known uh, conservative, uh, and he was also well-known for many colorful statements. He praised the Brazilian and Chilean uh, military uh, dictatorships. Uh, he ran on a campaign of anti-crime, uh, anti-corruption because his previous opponent uh, Lula da Silva was uh, jailed for corruption. Uh, uh, President Dilma Rousseff was impeached in, in 2016 and also ran on a platform of uh, pro-traditional values and, and small government. And certainly uh, a lot of people in the, the West, uh, including uh, here in Australia, really welcomed his election. It's not not often uh, we engage with Latin American politics, but uh, we know that how volatile and socialistic uh, Latin American countries have been. And so uh, the fact that a, a populist, outspoken person uh, won was, uh, was quite refreshing for, for international politics. This is a very interesting election because Brazil, it's been a long time since they've, they've they swung very, very left. Um, after the, the, the post-dictatorship realm. And the, uh, the ruling established uh, political class has been quite entrenched and, and, and it's, got, it's a young democracy, but it's quite a, it's quite a healthy uh, two-party sort of democracy uh, in that way. And um, this former little army captain, um, who then yeah, became a, a congressman for about 30 years, he, 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 he basically just opposed everything left. He just attacked the leftists the whole time. Um, and he didn't give up. He just, he just kept, kept on hammering, kept on hammering on domestic issues. Some, some people are calling him the, uh, the you know, a Churchill, um, because, you know, he, he, he's gonna, he wants to be tough on crime. He wants to be tough on, uh, on, on, you know, these, these some sort of sometimes territorially ambitious neighbors um you know there's big problems in bolivia for example with drugs and crime uh that always are leaking into brazil's territory with big there's big problems with argentina that's always been ha, has always quite an expansionist policy um the 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 brazil has also suffered quite heavily in uh in of late with the uh, with the FIFA World Games and others, because their their economy has taken quite a hit as they redirected all those resources 
to the to the to to those games, um, and and crime went up as they knocked out you know favelas and other things um, in in the wake of those games. So so crime and 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 things have been on quite especially in the core, um, you know from Fortaleza to to Brasilia, uh, Salvador. Um, crime has been quite a big issue and, and 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 he's got the same sort of crime problems as Duterte in the Philippines uh, which is why Brazilians overall have kind of said well you know the the, the current government was been paralyzed with they weren't passing many bills they weren't uh, they were you know, quite paralyzed by corruption uh, corruption uh, you know the leaders kept swapping and changing quite quite regularly um, not not the same sort of thing that Australian audience would recognise um, here, but but this is because of this is because of episodes of corruption, and the people just had had enough, um, and and industry had been suffering from from overtaxation and stuff, and so he just wants to cut away at, at all of this undercurrent. He wants to cut away at it and uh, and uh, rejuvenate. Um, a lot of Brazil's domestic. The the only the only problem um, that he poses is he doesn't have an environmental policy. Uh, that's the only thing. Brazil is harbors the largest chunk of the Amazon rainforest, uh, and which is you know the biggest uh, you know most bio, biodiverse region on the planet um, in terms of land, um, not the ocean obviously, but called the lungs of the world. And he and he won a lot of regional seats on not having an environmental policy. So a lot of experts and 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 people are worried. Ooh, is he is he going to is he going to allow uh, more deforestation? Um, and it might not sound very big to an Australian audience or to an American audience or to an English audience or something, uh, because it's a foreign problem. But uh, it, it it actually is. I mean, we're talking about Brazil where. You know, one of the one of the big things is the rainforest. Uh, uh, so you know, so he doesn't have an environmental policy. But then other people argue that because he will get tough on crime and because there is existing legislation against deforestation, he might actually enforce some of that and bring and and, and reinvest some of the proceeds back into local roads and its institutions and educational facilities and stuff like that. So, so there's some there's a there's a lot of positive things about this rise. The people the people want it. Uh, the people are you know uh, have swung that way. They 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 don't mind. Um, but there are one or two minor concerns. Well, e even though his election has been welcomed by people such as us and a lot of uh, right-wing commentators throughout the Western world and, and nationalists, the, of course the, the mainstream media have spent their time uh, being triggered by this uh, far-right uh, fascist uh, leader uh, being elected. And I've seen numerous articles uh, digging up uh, quotes that uh, Bolsonaro has said uh, about uh, gays and women. I'll just go through some of them. He said, uh, I would be being capable of loving a gay son, and he would prefer any gay son of his to die in an accident. Uh, he's also said that if uh, I see two men uh, kissing in the street, I will beat them. If your child starts to become like that, uh, you take a whip and you change their uh, behavior. And he said that because he's got four sons uh, and a daughter, he said he had a daughter at a moment of uh, weakness and said about a female congresswoman, uh, you're not worthy of raping, uh, you're very ugly. And he also implied a very sensible sort of policy about women, discrimination against women uh, he basically said uh, basically that uh, if you if you force employers to pay maternity leave they'll just hire less women and that he would hire less women on the back of that sort of economic principle uh, and, and he caught a lot of backlash for that he also said uh, uh, you know that he would he wished uh, I, I can't confirm this but I've seen this around a fair bit that he wished that uh, they that the police had uh, killed uh, well over two hundred thousand of the uh, the worst of the criminals in Brazil. So this is very strong rhetoric coming out of uh, <laughs> out of Brazil over here, and um, and it's domestic rhetoric. And you know it's it, sometimes in a country's life life cycle you do need to uh, 
cleanse some of the bad elements uh, of society. And this is this is this sort of rhetoric um, purifies and pushes back against some of the toxic, uh, you know, more toxic leftist thinking. Yeah, I mean, we can relate because you know we see the the feminist, the LGBT lobby, the you know soft on crime people dominating our culture and politics, and so when we see uh, stuff like that, we're like, you know, wow, like it's it's just refreshing. Like yeah, like it might offend some people, but you just need someone to react to, as it, the expression goes, push back, move the Overton window. The uh, the new transactional relationship that Donald Trump has with the world, and a lot of the world hasn't figured out that Donald Trump, he, he he's being he's a unilateralist now, and that he's engaging with a, tr a transactional relationship. Basically, it's a real estate deal making relationship with the world. If I do something and we shake on it something happens and uh and i think i think this this leader here he will understand that and that's why donald trump called him up and uh, said on the telephone that you know we we we're going to get along we, we had a great call we had a great conversation you know we're going to get along and i think if if our leaders here scott morrison turnbull or i think T tony abbott probably had it uh, Julia Gillard would not have had it, and uh, Kevin Rudd would not have had it. I think Tony Abbott was probably the strongest, and, and Turnbull, after he got knocked once, um, sort of got got it in the end. But uh, I think I think Brazil and America's relationship will become stronger through through these two leaders, at least while they both retain power, because it's transactional, it's strong, and uh, it's built on a, a sort of set of rules of 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 trust yeah bolsonaro he'll definitely be a nominee for uh the unshackled uh, unshackler of the year and i think maybe trump now that there's uh, a lot of uh, like-minded uh people being uh elected uh heads of government he should start i uh, forget the g g7 g8 the g deplorables <laughs> that's very funny it, the the world the world is the world is becoming realist. Um, if, if you're if you're into relations out there, where where it's going multipolar and it's going to a realist world, so uh, leaders leaders have to understand that they have to now start worrying about their own countries, worrying about their own people, worrying about their own systems. Uh, and, and I think that Mr. Bolsonaro will get that quite. Uh, get the message and, and do and, and do quite well on that. I think I think Canada up there has to learn a lot about everyone to the south of them at the moment because they're the uh, they looking like the one uh, little liberal stronghold of 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 um, the Americas right now, and it's not looking very pretty for Canada. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think I think I, I think he should definitely be nominated for that award. Probably the best news of the week was the announcement that Angela Merkel is stepping down as Chancellor of Germany. Now it's not going to be until 2021 when she's up for another federal election, but she is stepping down as the, the leader of her Christian Democrat Union Party at the, the end of the year. Now this was uh, due to a poor result for her party in the recent uh, Hesse state election, which followed uh, the disastrous result for her uh, sister party, the Christian Social Union uh, in uh, Bavaria. And both state elections, they both saw the rise of the alternative for, for Germany, uh, gain representation in uh, those uh, state parliaments. And so she basically <laughs> saw the, the writing on the wall that uh, her and her grand coalition partner, the Social Democrats, uh, they also fell within the vote so that both major parties uh, went down and all I can say is, well, it's about time. She's, well, she's been in power since 2005. She was considered a good, strong a female conservative leader, but of course she uh, she made her legacy when she's decided to let in the, the millions of uh, migrants from uh, the Middle East and, and Africa. Yeah, so so ch she's a very interesting character in in uh, in German history and in European history. As you said, 
she she did start out on a, quite a strong foot, and she's she's done very well for Germany, for Germany to navigate the eurozone crisis. So the eurozone crisis being the currency crisis, being the economic crisis, using the peripherals, using Greece, using Italy, using Cyprus and these other countries as as sort of buffer states to em embolden German power on the continent. Um, to the point where she has had mastery over the whole of the European Union. If, if she spoke in the European Parliament, everyone would listen. Um, right now, it's, it's, it's not shaping up to be that way at the moment. You brought up some of the issues. Um, she's gone soft on immigration. She's gone soft on immigration. She's gone soft on immigration since, since the immigration crisis started. Um, where initially, I think in 2015, she let in something like 800,000 mm. or, or a million uh, migrants straight into Germany, which which ruined countries on on, on uh, transit countries as well. Um, so her very selfish policy you know, pushed people up through through Turkey, through Greece, uh, through Austria, all the way up in, uh, to, to to Germany, and, and destroyed all of these countries uh, in their path so that she could absorb these countries. And, and the, the, the change has been so rapid, so quick, that European people are losing their identity. They don't know who they are or what they are or what they're doing anymore. And this immigration crisis has been eating away at her power ever since she instigated this policy of compassion, as they say. Uh, it's it's been an absolute disaster. But on the, on the currency front, uh, and the financial front, she has uh, been very good for Germany, but not for others. Um, if you ask any of the Greeks or any of the Cypriots. Yeah, yeah. I mean, letting in all these migrants, I mean, and uh, enfor uh, enforcing uh, austerity on all these other Eurozone countries. I mean, she's ba made Germany pretty hated. Oh, absolutely! It's the Fourth Reich of compassion. Um, it's the she 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 built up the Fourth Reich, and she's using it to punish uh, the Europeans for defeating them in uh, I don't know every war since the eighteen hundreds. <laughs> I don't think uh, it's that. I think she wants to forget that those wars ever happened. Yeah, I mean, I mean, everyone who loses wants to forget the wars that ever happened. But you know, that's that's kind of what happened, I guess. So you know, she she's punishing all these countries, and um, you know, she's being the she's the matron, the the matriarch, the matron, the <laughs> of Europe. You know, she's she's whipping Europe around, and, and Brexit. Uh, you know, Brexit. I mean, depending depending on not what you, how you look at it, Brexit was her fault. Okay, so if you if you want a unified world, um, this person who claims to be an, you know a leader of a united Europe and a promoter of a united Europe, well she she led she 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 was at the forefront of disengaging Europe of 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 causing Brexit. If you want to know what happened, why Brexit happened, well it's Angela Merkel because Angela Merkel decided to let loose the immigration crisis. Uh, you know, so so Brexit was her fault in, in that in that respect. It wasn't Nigel Farage. Nigel Farage was just a symptom of of Merkel's terrible policies. Um, the the other thing that the other thing that's going on as well is security. Uh, you know, there's the, the the Germans, Germans, French, everyone. They don't feel safe anymore. Um, there's no safety or security. I mean, there's no there's no cultural security. There's no physical security. There's no digital security. Every all, all of the security mechanisms have broken down and shattered around. Um, one of the things that Je uh, Merkel said when she opened the floodgates up is, "We are going to open the floodgates up because Germany is a strong country." Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's, well, you know. They've got their little puff, okay. They've got their little puff of glory. They run Europe for a little bit, but now it's over, and that's what that's what the Christian Democratic Union and the and the uh, CSU and all these other coalitions are saying. Because regional people and the people who have to take the brunt of uh, Mrs. Merkel's policies are, are are being devastated. They're being economically devastated. They're being they're being culturally devastated. They're being racially devastated. They're being, uh, you know, nationally de de devastated. Um, 
it's it's atrocious, and and the whole of the European front is being uh, devastated as well. And 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 she did an atrocious, an absolute atrocious uh, intervention in the Ukraine in the Donbass region as well, uh, where she tried to blame Russia and said, "Oh, Russia," and 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 basically was a front for Barack Obama in his in his insane campaign to uh, to. Uh, you know, have to pr promote some sort of instigate some sort of spark of nuclear war with Russia. So M Mrs. Merkel came within a hair of of leading Barack Obama into having you know, nuclear war with Russia because she wouldn't let go of Ukraine because she wouldn't let go of the Donbass. So you know, this is this is a terribly you know, so, so she's she's played right on the edge. She's played with German lives, with American lives. She's done financially well in the, for Germany. That's and that's and, and you know and she's held the French the French German alliance together in terms of through the European Union mechanism. But everything else around her has fallen apart, and that is what's starting to reflect on average German people. Yeah, I mean, just look at the the increase in in crime. I mean, there was the the famous uh, New Year's Eve sexual assault of, of women in uh, Cologne in, in uh, 2016, uh, 17, and uh, not only is, are these uh, rising crime rates uh, ignored, but Merkel's tried to, to cover it up, uh, working with uh, me mainstream media and social media companies to uh, crack down on on reporting uh, of this and. It's really created a lot of uh, resentment. There was mass uh, protests by so-called far-right uh, people after a migrant murdered a German in Chemnitz uh, a few few months ago. You see, what she doesn't understand and what she didn't understand is that Germany reunified because Germany wanted to be Germany. Okay, the reason they reunified it is because they wanted to have their own culture and cultural norms and they wanted to be a, 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 a country that wasn't you know separated in two or that didn't go back to the old roman empire notion of of uh, you know a holy roman empire where there were separate kingdoms everywhere they wanted to be germany okay they wanted to be a german state with the german language and people and, and culture and be proud of what they are but what she's done is she said no, no, no. I feel bad about World War Two, and I feel bad about World War One. So therefore, I will inflict my own personal feelings onto the German people, whether they like it or not. So she sort of, she sort of. When you hear about all these rapes and these murders and these and 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 the social crime and 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 the, there's a huge Turkish sort of they're not called Turkish but they're they're basically Arabic populations within Germany itself within Berlin especially um, and these people uh, hate her because they 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 now are ostracized because under the under the diversity and inclusion act and stuff they they were actually doing quite well they were seen as sort of german and they were sort of you know doing their own thing in in, in their little suburbs and stuff and they were they were fine but then she's brought all these migrants in and now these people have become lumped in as terrorists you know you know and, and so they they absolutely re resent her for this so you know so it's made she's made a mess but she's lumped those people in, you know, with with this sort of hardline green, you know, sort of mentality. You know, we the, the, the Green Party in in, in Germany, uh, they say that anyone with blue eyes and blonde hair has to be eliminated. You know, that, that they have to. We have to import. Um, you know, you know. I actually read. I actually read a European Union uh, document. That said that there, because of climate change and other things, by the 2050, there will be maybe 100 million, 200 million something uh, you know, refugees on on the border of uh, of Europe. Okay, 
And the green, the Greens uh, in Germany said that's great because that means Europe will no longer be light or blue eyed or blonde eyed, you know, have blue eyes and blonde hair anymore. So bring it on, you know. Yeah. Well, the 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 fact that she's loved by globalists and now leftists uh, believe that in the era of Trump uh, she's the the leader of the free world. I mean, I saw a tweet by Yasmin Abdel Megid uh, lamenting the uh, resignation of Angela Merkel. I mean, when you have someone like that endorsing you i mean that's pretty much sums up who who you've been in as a leader yeah so you you see a lot of these global the same the same types i mean barack obama and and, and herself were, were were very tight okay and barack is the head of head of the snake and everyone knows that he represents all of that uh that world and and they were they were as tight as tight as can get and um you know, and and the other the other scandal actually uh, that's happened in the last week that could have a contributing factor is the fact that she doesn't want to fund, uh, you know, sell arms to Saudi Arabia. Now that's I'm not sure if that's a, there's a direct correlation uh, there, but you know it's something that happened and then reflected in uh, it's been reflected in um, the uh, the. Uh, polling results and the electoral results, because Saudi Arabia obviously is one of the you know one one of the big uh, the big players in the Middle East, which is causing a lot of the instability up in Syria, and and causing a lot of the Syrian migrant crisis. So I'm not sure if there's a direct correlation to her not wanting to fund or funding or, or something, but. Uh, I don't. I don't think so. Nah. Uh, I think you're stretching it a bit there. Oh yeah. So so um, I'm I'm not I'm not totally sure if if um, there is a correlation between that crisis and this one, but but overall the the points that you've already addressed, which is mainly the migrant crisis and the politically correct crisis and, and the fact that you know, in the cultural crisis, the the, the whole Christmas thing. Uh, if, if there are there are comparisons, and your viewers can go out there and look up comparisons of Polish Christmas versus uh, you know German Christmas, and Polish Christmas looks fantastic. Okay? I'd go to Polish Christmas any day. It looks fun, safe, healthy, children everywhere, uh, you know everything. German Christmas looks very dull and boring, and and with uh, what are they the, the peace, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean they'll be they'll be living with Merkel's legacy. I mean she's been in power for for thirteen years. I mean, uh, f uh, uh, that's enough to cement your vision on a nation. And all I can say is Angela Merkel, don't slam the door on your way out. But uh, that's all we've got uh, time for uh, on today's show. There was a lot to discuss. Uh, it's all happening internationally at the moment. That's why uh, you've been my most uh, regular uh, co-host. Uh, uh, who knows what will happen next? <laughs> The internet, the world is the world is breaking up, Tim. The world is starting to the, the United Nations is starting to uh, unfold. The, the the peasants, the people, the, the, the real people, they're rising up. They, they said we don't want to be peasants anymore, and we want our countries and our cultures and, and our belief systems and our political systems. We want our own sovereignty again. We don't want to be under the thumb of. Uh, you know, bankers and, and, and globalist politicians and, and the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank or whoever it is. They don't want to be, you know, suppressed by these anymore. So all, all of these uh, actions, you know, uh, um, there's more and more and more of it as, as instead of this notion that we're a one world, you know, with no problems and that we all have a global problem or something, that's all being eliminated and we're starting to see what's actually beneath and what's actually layers and layers and layers of corruption and crime and, and degradation and years and years of abuse and, and, and it's all starting to work through and the people, the people want these problems, these localized problems to be sorted out. And that's why you're going to see more and more and more international news as people rise up, replace these globalist leaders and start to fix their local communities, fix their countries, fix their regions. Uh, you know, this, this is a fix their families. You know, all the bad things that we've been told for, for 70 years are bad. 
we'll certainly be here to, to cover it when it happens. Thanks very much, Tim. Always, always appreciate it, and we'll keep our eyes on the globe. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. There has been a big change with the Gavin McGuinness Australian Tour that we've been promoting on this show. It has now been moved to December and will now include anti-Islam activist and British Values campaigner Tommy Robinson, and it is billed as the Deplorables Tour. Tickets for Gavin's tour have now been converted to Deplorables tickets, visiting the same cities. If you haven't got your tickets yet, you can now do so by going to the new tour website, which is the deplorables.com. Com.au. The Victorian state election is being held on Saturday the 24th of November, so join us for another election night live stream starting at 6pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time when the polls close. Join me on Facebook and YouTube Live along with my panel, which will be The Young Conservative, David Hiscock from XYZ, and free speech advocate Mangus O'Mallon. It is shaping up to be a closely fought election, so it will be an interesting night. Also, if you want to take a stand against Antifa violence, there is another free speech rally happening in Melbourne, hosted by the Australian Freedom of Speech Movement, which is run by our panellist for election night, Magnus O'Mellon. That is on Saturday the 1st of December at 12pm in the Melbourne CBD. Also, as always, I'd like to remind you we cannot do everything we do at The Unshackled without your support. And of course, the best form of support is becoming a patron of The Unshackled over at patreon.com slash The Unshackled. Or like many of you have been doing recently, uh, sending us a direct contribution via our PayPal link, which is paypal.me slash The Unshackled, which all helps go a long way. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you for the next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.